Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. It was called the Great War. The war to end war. The war to make this world safe for democracy. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way. We know this war today as World War I because there was a World War II. It was the bloodiest and most destructive war in human history to that point. With me today to talk about the Great War is Dr. Dave Krieger, Professor Emeritus of History at the college and a frequent guest on the program. Dave, welcome back. Thank you. When George Washington left office, he composed a farewell address to the American people, which was published in newspapers. In that farewell address, he warns the American people against entangling alliances with foreign powers. Explain how entangling alliances uh, preceded this terrible, terrible war. Okay. An entangling alliance is essentially an alliance which requires a country who is a member of the alliance to take action. Uh, there's no wiggle room. For example, if your ally is attacked, you must automatically come to assistance and go to war. Um, and per the war lasted from 1914 to 1918. Its origins were in Europe, among the so-called great powers, as they were. And an alliance system developed uh, uh, in the period between uh, about 1875 uh, and about uh, 1907. Uh, in which all of the great powers became involved in one of, of two alliances. There was the Triple Alliance, which consisted of uh, Germany, Austria-Hungary, a large multi-ethnic empire no longer in existence, and then the third country was Italy. And the, uh, the terms of that alliance were is that if one member was attacked, the other members were required to come to the assistance of the country attacked. In other words, an attack on one is an attack on all. It brings mm -hmm. them all into war. The other alliance was known as the Triple Entente. Entente is a French word. It means understanding. It was not quite as strong mm -hmm. as the Triple Alliance. The Triple Entente included a series of, of basically three treaties. We need, need not go into all three of them. But the countries involved were France, Russia, and Great Britain. And uh, essentially, as the alliance developed over time, it became very much like the Triple Alliance, where you almost had a moral obligation go to go to war uh, if one of your allies was attacked. Both of these alliance groups were held together by treaties which were considered secret. They were secret only in the sense that the details of the treaty were not all known to the other side. Everybody knew who was involved in these alliances. Something else that happened as these alliances were, were formed is that they began to go out in search of lesser nations to become part of these alliances, so you draw in smaller countries. For example, the Ottoman Empire, no longer in existence today. Its remnant we know as Turkey. Uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, became a member of the Central Powers um, or, or the Triple Alliance. Uh, Serbia, um, which is a country which has been reconstituted today, uh, Serbia became a member of the Triple Entente. So all of these little countries are pulled in to these alliances. And you can really think of these alliance groups as being a series of dominoes set on end in a row. Uh, put uh, um, Austria first, put its enemy uh, Russia second, uh, put uh, Germany third, put France fourth, and so on. If two of these countries go to war, it's like pushing over that row of dominoes, mm -hmm. and all of them will become involved. Mm -hmm. So once the war began, the, uh, the Triple Alliance became the, the central powers. That's correct. Became and then known the as Triple a... Entente became the allied powers. That's correct. Because the, the, the Triple Alliance did seem to occupy the center of Europe. Um, the alliance groups came into, into being uh, basically because the creation of a new country. And this may surprise some people, but the new country was Germany, mm -hmm. which came into existence in 1870. Um, occupying the center of Europe. Germany came into existence in 1870 through a series of wars, the last of which was a war against France. Germany was very much a militaristic, 
aristocratic monarchical power. And she went to war against Republican France. France, the country of revolution, the, the country of liberal democracy. And uh, France was badly defeated by Germany. Germany occupied French territory and Ger uh, Germany took uh, uh, French territory known as Alsace-Lorraine. Germany also held the signing of the peace treaty at the end of the uh, Franco-Prussian War, as it was known in 1871, at the Palace of Versailles in France. And there in the Hall of Mirrors, if you've ever seen pictures of it, this grand or ornate room, um, France was forced to sign a peace treaty to recognize the existence of Germany. Also in that very same room, the existence of the German Empire was declared. And the object of Germany was to humiliate the French. And the French thereafter had a foreign policy. Their aim was revenge, revenge mm -hmm. for the humiliation mm -hmm. of 1871. We were talking before the program, uh, and there's a, there's a famous painting, I know you've seen it, where Kaiser Wilhelm, there he is in the Hall of Mirrors with all of his generals and his flags around them. That is really stepping on someone when they're down. And it does set up this revenge motive clearly. And you would think if you were going to have a coronation of an emperor or a kaiser, you do it in Berlin. But oh no, we'll do it in the very symbol of French power and glory, the Versailles Palace. That is correct. Now, all of that harshness created a real problem for Germany in the center of Europe. One of the things that Germany worried about was a two-front war. Uh, having made France a permanent enemy, the fear was France might gain an ally, particularly in Russia, mm -hmm. which lay to Germany's east, France's to the west, exposing Germany to a two-front war. In order to deal with that kind of situation, Germany, uh, uh, the German Empire went out and negotiated a series of alliances. Uh, it first negotiated an alliance with Austria-Hungary, then later added in Italy, which was known as the Triple Alliance. Let's talk a bit about Austria-Hungary. That's such an odd concept, a dual monarchy. Okay, the, the Austria-Hungary was known as the dual monarchy. Uh, it came into existence in the 1860s. Um, it was once known as the Austrian Empire. It, it uh, occupied the area, if you can envision a map of Europe today, uh, it occupied the area that would include the modern day countries of Austria, Czechoslovakia, parts of Poland, uh, Romania, uh, Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro. Um, that whole large central area was the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was a holdover from an early period prior to the existence of nationalism, in which people did not identify themselves as members of a nation. Um, by the 1860s, the Hungarians in the empire were agitating for independence, so the Hungarians were given some autonomy. And the emperor of Austria became the emperor of Austria and the king of Hungary. Hence, you get the so-called dual monarchy, as mm -hmm. it was called, Austria-Hungary. Mm -hmm. But Austria-Hungary was a powder keg with all these various nationalities agitating for independence. The assumption was then if you spoke the same language, you ought to be a member of an independent country. For example, all people who speak uh, Slovakian ought to have their own nation. All people who speak Hungarian ought to have their mm -hmm. own country. And that created a real dilemma, a real problem for that empire. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Russian Empire was also multi-ethnic. The Russian Empire was also multi-ethnic. The Russian Empire was also regarded as perhaps the most backward mm -hmm. of the major powers. It was ruled by an autocratic czar, and the last of these czars, Nicholas II, he's the one who's associated with Rasputin and, uh, and the like, and uh, uh, was a, uh, an inept, uh, feeble character as far as being a ruler. Um, he, had a, he had promised uh, some representative government and then promptly withdrew it. Um, there was a rising middle class which wanted a legislature. He refused. 
uh, there were an increasing number of, of people who'd been abroad to study who come back to Russia, which is oppressive, ill-educated, and the result were terrorist groups everywhere in the country attempting to assassinate czars and assassinate political officers. The country was highly unstable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, the two most uh, irresponsible uh, major powers in Europe uh, by the early uh, 20th century were Russia and Austria-Hungary, mm -hmm. both of them uh, uh, enemies. Mm -hmm. Both of them believed they wanted to control the Balkans. The Balkans is an area that you would know today primarily as Greece, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, the former Yugoslavia. That's the Balkans. The Balkan powder keg. The Balkan powder keg. Yeah. The Balkans in the early 20th century were very much like the Middle East today, an mm -hmm. area of unending crisis, one after another with seemingly no solution. Mm -hmm. Russia, regard, the, the, most of the people in the Balkans are, are considered to be Slavic people. The Russians, the European Russians, are Slavic. Russia regarded herself as the defender and the protector of the Slavic people. The big people, brother. The mm -hmm. big brother. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what is the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the dual empire, faced a problem. She controlled an area called Bosnia, which is part of the Balkans, and there was an independent country that bordered Bosnia, whose name was Serbia. Mm -hmm. The Serbs were agitating to become the rulers of the entire Balkan peoples, and particularly the Bosnians. The great, Greater Serbia. The Greater mm -hmm. Serbia. They mm -hmm. established a, a terrorist organization known as the Black Hand, mm -hmm. and a Black Hand would appear on their propaganda uh, uh, circulars, and these were flooded into Bosnia and everywhere. and, and uh, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire believed it had to snuff out the existence of Serbia if it was to prevent an ethnic and nationalist conflagration throughout its entire empire. Mm -hmm. So now we come to... Uh... In other words, these two big powers are fighting over a backwater. Mm -hmm. So we come to a fateful day in June of 1914 when a man named Franz Ferdinand and his spouse Sophie decide to pay a visit to a place called Sarajevo. Why yes. might not that be a good place for this fellow to visit? Well, they didn't go to see the Olympics, right. which is what Sarajevo is known for today. Right. Sarajevo was the administrative capital of Bosnia. And a hotbed of, Ser uh, of uh, Slavic nationalism. Uh, right, it was. Um, Franz Ferdinand was the heir to the Austrian throne. The old emperor, his name was Franz Joseph, had been around since 1848. In fact, the man ruled for 68 years. Mm. And as one of my professors said, he was like a piece of gristle that you couldn't swallow. You kept <laughs> chewing him and he kept, you couldn't swallow him, he, he, there he was. Franz Ferdinand thought he would make a uh, visit to Sarajevo and Bosnia, sort of a goodwill trip. Mm -hmm. And he was sort of a reformer, interested in holding together the big empire. Mm -hmm. He was warned not to go because it was dangerous, but he decided he would go anyway. So he and his wife and an entourage went to Sarajevo. They had some ceremonies at the city hall. There's a, there's a, a, a newsreel a picture of him coming out, uh, dressed in a hat with big feathers everywhere. These, these people like to wear these ostentatious mm -hmm. uniforms. Mm -hmm. Got in this car and drove up the street. And sure enough, a college student, wouldn't you know it, and a member of the Black Hand, this terrorist organization, was standing there on the curb. And the car comes by. He has a pistol. He steps forward. He aims, aims the pistol almost at point-blank range at Franz Joseph, pulls the trigger, kills him, and kills his, his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was Gavriel Princep. He then turned to fled and was going to flee across the river, but the water was only ankle deep and they right. caught him. Um, at any rate, the heir to the Austrian throne has been assassinated. Mm -hmm. Another thing too about that assassination, and it's fascinating, there are multiple accounts of this. And one of the things I read is the, 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 the root of this parade, if you will, was published in the newspaper. So these assassins, and there were several of them, were all along. Uh, before uh, Princip bumped him off, there was a man named Kabrinovic, who was 19 years old, who threw out a bomb or a hand grenade. And there are various versions. One version is, is that uh, 
the heir to the throne batted it away like a defensive back on a pass. Uh, other versions that hit the street. This guy tried to kill himself by swallowing a cyanide capsule. It was too weak. <laughs> he jumped into this river. It was too shallow. It's just almost comic opera of this whole yeah. silly thing. The, uh, the, the, you mentioned the, the, uh, 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 the motorcade's route through the streets of Sarajevo. Uh, the drivers were not as familiar with it as they should be, exactly. and uh, and they were slowed down. They couldn't go very fast. Um, not that cars went very fast back then, but at one point the lead car made a a wrong turn and went into a dead end alley. Mm -hmm. So the whole whole uh, and that's how Princep got him. That's how right. Princep. The whole entourage mm -hmm. had to come to a stop so the lead yeah. cars could back yeah. out. And and sitting there right in front of Princep is Franz Joseph in his in his big automobile. That's right. And the automobile is on display in a museum yeah. in Vienna. It's quite, a, it's quite an exhibit there. The interesting thing about the assassination of Franz Ferdinand is it did not immediately lead to war. Mm -hmm. it, would be at least a it would be a month or so before war was declared. Um, the, reason, the reason for that is that Austria-Hungary needed, first of all, to make certain it would have the support of its major ally, Germany. Mm -hmm. um, we're also at the point in 1914 where there had already been a series of crises in the Balkans. And we are at the point where the Austro-Hungarian Empire wants to bring an end to Serbia and wants to use the assassination of Francis Ferdinand in Bosnia as an occasion to eliminate Serbia as a player in the Balkans. And so the Austro-Hungarian government consults with the German government. Uh, a German diplomat many years earlier had once said that the Balkans were not worth the bones of one dead Pomeranian soldier. Now, we know a Pomeranian is a dog, but Pomeranian <laughs> is a part of Germany. Yeah. Uh, but Germany was desperate to maintain its alliance, its ally with Austria-Hungary. So Germany issued what was called a blank check. In other words, you Austrians do what you think is necessary with Serbia and we'll be there to back you up. In the meantime, Russia is very much alarmed by this situation, and Russia has suffered a series de of defeats in the Balkans. She can't endure another one. She's the protector of those people. She turns to her major ally, France, and asks what France would do in the event that Russia went to war against Austria to protect Serbia. And the French, desperate to maintain their alliance, said issued, in essence, a blank check to the Russians. Do what you think is necessary. We'll be there for you. So these two countries who are itching to go to war in the Balkans, Austria-Hungary and Russia, both have uh, uh, pretty solid agreements from their stronger allies to, to come to their defense. Austria then came up with a series of demands that it issued to Serbia to investigate the country and ferret out the black hand and bring it to an end and essentially make Serbia a protectorate of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The purpose of the, and an ultimatum was issued to the Serbs. You, you accept the Austro-Hungarian demands or we will go to war against you. Uh, the demands were written in such a way that Serbia could not accept them. Austria-Hungary wanted a war. Mm -hmm. And when Serbia failed to accept uh, those demands, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. Russia then declared, mobilized, we need to talk about mobilization, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mobilized its military forces to go to war against Austria. And at that point, diplomatic notes flew everywhere uh, because it was clear a war was going to begin. Mm -hmm. The Germans, of course, have what's called the Schlieffen Plan to deal with this. Talk about that a little bit. Okay. Uh, the, uh, l let me back up just a sure, little bit. Sure, sure. Um, one of the things that helped to strengthen these alliances uh, were military plans. They were known as mobilization plans in which you would mobilize your army. You had your regular standing army. You then had a large army of reserves, which you would have to bring up to the front to put on a wartime footing. Each nation developed a single military plan, a plan of attack. 
No one in 1914 had a plan where they would come up to the, uh, uh, the enemy's border and then wait to see what would happen, but a plan of attack, because it was thought you had to have movement in order to have military success. Russia had its plan of attack, Germany had its plan of attack, the French had its plan of attack, and so on. Um, mobilization plans, when you called up and brought up the reserves, were designed in such a way that they had to be carried out with almost minute-by-minute uh, minute precision. You know, you have a whole series of trains, and, and, and troops are brought to the front, and supplies are brought by trains. In fact, uh, uh, railroads were built to support these military mobilization mm. plans. Mm. And if you're in the center of, say, Germany, and you need to move a unit to the French border, this train is going to have to leave there. It's going to have to move through a series of, of stations and cities and railroad yards to get to the front at a particular time so the train can be unloaded and then shunted aside onto a siding for the next train mm -hmm. to come because 60 or 70 trains a day are bringing troops to the front. So once your mobilization plan goes into effect, it can't be stopped. Because if you did stop it in the middle, it would take several weeks to sort everything out, and the country would be defenseless. Mm -hmm. So Russia orders a mobilization after Austria declares war um, on Serbia, and the mobilization will go forward. Um, the German Emperor, uh, Wilhelm II, the Kaiser. As Kaiser was, Bill. Kaiser Bill, as he is known right. sometimes in this country, yeah. shoots a note over to the uh, Russian Emperor, and he, it's entitled Nikki. They were cousins. Nikki, stop right. the mobilization. And Nikki fires a telegram back and says, Willie, I don't know if I can. I'll see what I can do. And in the end, he couldn't. Oh. And so you get these telegrams flying back and forth. Germany had a plan for fighting a two-front war because here's Russia and here's France. And her plan to fight a two-front war was known as the Schlieffen Plan. The Schlieffen Plan was based on the assumption that Russia, being the more backward of the Triple Entente powers, would be very slow to mobilize and, and, and be prepared to invade Germany from the east. So the Schlieffen Plan called to concentrate German forces on the French frontier it engage in France, they would sweep through Belgium, and almost like a swinging door, uh, this is Belgium right here, they would go along the, uh, the English Channel coast like this, come all the way down, uh, take Paris, and mop up and swing back on this hinge and uh, encircle the French army. Mm -hmm. Once that was accomplished, troops could then be taken by rail to the Eastern Front to deal with the Russians. That's the Schlieffen plan. A Kaiser Bill said, and I quote, Paris for lunch, dinner at St. Petersburg. That's right. <laughs> and uh, he, he was badly mistaken. Yes. Because one of the things that they all forgot is that war plans rarely go as expected. One of the difficulties with these war plans is that each alliance group, the countries of each alliance group, uh, uh, well, let's just take one group, the, the Triple Entente, the, the Russians, the French, and the British. They have their military plans, they have their military secrets, but they began to share their military secrets. They began to share their plans. So the French develop a, a military plan based on the assumption of what the British will do when they enter the war. Good example, the British and, and French navies. The British would protect the, the French, and, uh, French and English waters off the English Channel and the Atlantic Ocean. The French Navy would be responsible for providing uh, a naval presence for Britain and France in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. The Mediterranean being important because of the Suez Canal. A and so you get these kinds of agreements so that when a war develops, you almost have a moral obligation, as it was put back then, to enter the war on the side of your, your alliance. And so the wars could not be stopped. These, these, these Great military buildups. They had the largest armies and navies they'd ever had uh, in history up to that time. We're, we're supposedly going to provide security. After all, this was the modern age. It was 1914, you know. And um, these armies were being, uh, uh, and navies were being put together so they would never be used. Now, if you recall the Cold War, that was the primary mm -hmm. rationale as to why we maintained a gigantic nuclear arsenal. We maintained it so it would never be used. Thank goodness the Russian or Soviet Empire fell apart. Mm -hmm. um, 
everyone became insecure. Germany decided that she needed to be a world power. She had not been one. And the best way to become a world power was to build a navy. The naval power in, uh, in the world at that time was Great Britain. Mm -hmm. She ruled the seven seas. Her empire was at its peak. She controlled one-fourth of the world's surface. The sun never set on the British Empire until the war was over. But uh, Germany decided she would challenge the British and engage in this fantastic naval building program. Britain believed she had to have a navy double the size of her nearest competitor. Well, she's challenged by the Germans, so the British then began to increase the size of their navy and build more ships. They built what were called dreadnoughts. We know them as battleships. And every new battleship was larger than the one before. The German response to the naval pro building program in Britain was to build more ships. And it sort of cycled out of control. It's an arms race. It's an arms mm -hmm. race. Mm -hmm. But there was also overconfidence that a war could not happen. There had not been a big major war for a hundred years. They were called the Napoleonic Wars. Mm -hmm. Oh, there'd been a lot of little wars and they'd all been contained, like a war between France and Germany. Mm -hmm. But it didn't involve all the countries of Europe. 99 years without and a major war. And in 1914, war. as these countries fell into war, it was assumed the war, which began in uh, late July, early August of 1914, would be over by Christmas uh, and everyone would come home. And it would be a nice adventure their crowds cheered. Uh, it was the last time Europeans cheered going to war, mm -hmm. except maybe for the Falkland Wars in yeah. Britain. And there are a number of, of fascinating accounts of uh, young men. It, it was this, they were going off to a festival or, or a Super Bowl or something, uh, uh, tingling with excitement and what a wonderful adventure this is. And they got their fancy uniform. And I mean, there was no shortage of recruits and everyone was going off to this glorious affair. And if you didn't hurry up and enlist, what could you tell your grandkids? You were too late. You went into it. That is true. And uh, uh, there, there's a story about uh, uh, French cadets coming out of the French military academy. And the, the French army at the time wore a uniform which consisted of bright red pants and a, and a, and a bright blue tunic. This goes way back to the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. They're very proud of this uniform. And these cadets said that when they marched into battle, they'd be wearing their blue tunic, their red trousers, and their white gloves. Yes. Well. 75% of them died in that first year of the war. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, it was concluded that military uniforms are best the color of ground, which is where you get this olive drab color right. that right. Uh, that everybody right. wore. Right. So the conflict begins. The Guns of August, as Barbara Tuckman's famous book is called. And uh, let's talk primarily about the, the Western Front. Okay. Again, the War of Movement. This is what we're supposed to have. a war quick, hard-hitting, fast-moving, That's uh, correct. and it doesn't work out. That's right. So what happens? Well, the, the, uh, the German plan was probably overly ambitious. Uh, the, if you think of the German plan, its far right flank, which is on the English Channel, has an enormous amount of distance to cover. And the plan was to invade Bel Belgium, neutral Belgium, as mm -hmm. it became known with the propagandists to carry out the swinging door plan. And the Belgians put up some res resistance which slowed the movement. Yeah, much more than the Germans thought. Much more than the Germans mm -hmm. had anticipated. Um, the, uh, uh, the swinging door movement began and they began moving. Uh, the, the far right flank of this door outpaced its supplies, out, uh, outpaced, outpaced its communications. Now when the Germans went into Belgium, that brings the British in. Right. The British. The British hesitated initially to ent enter the war. Um, I think they would have anyways, yeah. but, uh, yeah. uh, but uh, this is called the Rape of Belgium. And mm -hmm. indeed, there was some rather harsh treatment of Belgian Oh, well, my grandmother talked Be about Bil that when Belgian I was a kid. Resistance yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and, uh, 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 and uh, this riled the, the English public. You know, one of the things that was affecting diplomacy at that time was the penny press, the newspaper, and, and public opinion. So uh, the, the British leaders felt they were sort of being pressed into war, and so Britain declared war and sent an expeditionary force over into northern France. Um, the, uh, uh, the German line came close to disarray. A problem then developed 
the Russian army, whose plan was to invade Germany from the east, had mobilized and gotten into action much mm -hmm. sooner than Germany had expected. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they were within what's known as East Prussia. Today, it's a part of Poland. And there was only a skeleton army in the eastern part of Germany. So, so some units had to be shifted from this western front with France into the east, and that reduced the number of uh, uh, troops that Germany had in the west. And, and, and uh, the, the, the Germans were falling into disarray, and a con decision was made, instead of sweeping around the city of Paris, to instead shorten the door and swing, which would be um, east of Paris, and just try to uh, envelop and sweep up the, the French army. And so they moved in that direction. And what that did was to expose this flank as they moved to the French, who are over here, and they counterattacked. And that brought an end to, the, to this Schlieffen plan, which was going to end the war mm -hmm. on victorious terms for Germany in, in, in a few weeks. So they were stopped on the Marne River, the first battle of the Marne. And of course, one of the interesting aspects of that was the famous taxi cab oh, yes. army, where the, uh, the French uh, shuttled troops to the front in Paris, taxi cabs, presumably with the meter not running. One of those <laughs> taxi cabs is on display in the French National right. Military. It it's is. a Renault yeah. car. Uh, so now they're stopped. They're stopped. And then what happens? And they're, they're stopped on the Marne River, and it was assumed that cavalry units, mounted horsemen, oh, yeah. would play an important role here in, in this war, and, and, and this war of movement grinds to a halt. Um, there had been some other problems, too, along the line. The French plan of attack was to attack further south into an area known as Alsace-Lorraine, but they were repulsed. The problems are known as the machine gun mm. and heavy artillery, particularly the machine gun. Because the problem with troops going across an open field, we're talking about soldiers who probably weighed 120, 130 pounds back then, carrying backpacks weighing 60 pounds, half their weight. They didn't run across these fields. Mm -hmm. And machine guns could literally mow them down. So you dug in. This was not anticipated. You dug in into a trench. And the French dug into a trench. The Germans dug into a trench. And from there, you would then try to conduct uh, assaults against the enemy lines. The enemies, of course, had their machine guns set up, and they just mow people down. Mm -hmm. And so the war of movement became a war of stalemate. Mm -hmm. And those quickly. trenches ran from the, the, the sea coast clear to the Swiss border. 400 and something miles of That is trenches. correct. And, and these, these are elaborate oh, uh, very. Uh, trench works because to bring troops up to the front, you couldn't march them over open ground because mm -hmm. they could be mowed down. So you had to march them through trenches Support that snaked trenches. their way right. up, up right. to the right. trenches right. at right. the front. And I think this is where the real horror of World War I comes in is this trench warfare. We've, we've seen photographs, these trenches with muck and mire, and they're up to the knees in water, trench foot, rats as big as cats, all sorts of horrible things. Uh, and then the dreaded no man's land in between. Uh, just really terrible. That is, that is correct. Uh, the distance between enemy trenches could range anywhere from uh, uh, 50 yards up to uh, perhaps a mile or two miles, depending, depending on the area mm -hmm. you were in. Mm -hmm. Each side put up huge barbed wire uh, I guess you'd call them fortifications in front of their lines to make it difficult for the enemy mm -hmm. to get through. Mm -hmm. The way you conducted a battle once these trenches were in place, a battle that would involve as, as, as many as a million men, mm -hmm. and a, a battle that would range over several months. Mm -hmm. The way you did this was to conduct an artillery bombardment, which might go on for two or three weeks, with gigantic guns hurling millions and millions of shells. Mm -hmm. They fell on in what was called no man's land, which was the land between these trenches. And if you look at aerial photographs of the area before and after a bombardment, before the bombardment you see the roads and the fields. After the bombardment it looks like the surface of the moon. It does. Huge craters, nothing left. Mm -hmm. You'd conduct this bombardment. The idea was you would destroy the enemy trenches. Um, the trouble with the bombardment, it alerted the enemy as to exactly where you were going to attack, so there was no surprise involved. Mm -hmm. Once that was done, 
your soldiers would then go over the top, as it was called. Right. They, they'd leave their trenches and begin walking towards the enemy lines. Mm -hmm. At that point, the machine guns opened fire. Mm -hmm. And if you could gain perhaps five or six yards of territory with only the loss of a couple hundred thousand men, it was considered okay. Yeah. The trouble is you kept running out of men. Right. And every year you had to bring in more men and older men. I think that the two battles that really illustrate the point you're making are Verdun and the Somme, both 1916. That's correct, yes. Uh, we're used to battles in the United States. Gettysburg is July the 1st to July the 3rd, 1863. The Battle of Verdun began in February of 1916, ended in December of 1916. Um, more than 40 million artillery shells were fired in this battle. Um, and, and again, the Germans are trying to break through Verdun, this fortress town. Uh, the French adopted the motto, they shall not pass, and they didn't. Casualty numbers, uh, French 378,000, uh, 120,000 dead. Uh, the Germans 337,000, 100,000 killed. Uh, Verdun is home to a, to a war memorial. It's called the Ossuary, and it's on a hilltop. And it, it, uh, as you, you approach this monument, it had the, 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 this has a central tower in the shape of an artillery shell. And as you approach the monument, you pull up into the parking lot, there are picture windows all on the base. What do you see through the windows? You see bones, human bones, 110,000 unidentified French and German soldiers. Uh, Verdun had a huge effect on the psyche of the French people. The Somme. Uh, the British were decided to counterattack against the Germans right. and take pressure away from, from Verdun. This battle began on the 1st of July, 1916, ended on, in, in November of 1916. Again, casualty numbers. British and French casualties, 600,000, 150,000 killed. German, 650,000, 160,000 killed. Savage, savage battles. These battles were seared into the consciousness of the European people. The Somme, for example, most Americans have never heard of these battles. mean absolutely nothing That's to right. them. Several years ago, my wife and I visited, and our son, the Somme battlefield, and we rode out from Paris on one of those TGV trains. That was fun, anyway. We got to the station uh, near, near, near the battlefield, and there was a young man, a, a Canadian. It was a college student from, from Vancouver. And so he said he wanted to go out to the battlefield. And I said, well, we've been here before. Public transport's not so hot. Why don't we, we, we hire a cab, share, share a cab? And I said, so I said, well, are you a history major? Why are you here? No, he said, I have come to, to leave uh, uh, some mementos on the graves of my two great, uh, great, great uncles, one British and one Canadian. So here you got Dave, a kid, probably 21 years old from Vancouver, British Columbia is bringing a little token. And what they have, they're little wooden crosses with a, with a poppy in the middle. And they write things in memory of my great uncle. That really struck me. How many 21-year-old Americans have any notion about something that their ancestor fought? When we were out at this huge monument, uh, there were tour buses pulling up, British tour buses, and the people would get out and would put the little wooden crosses. And th we're talking, this was uh, oh, four or five years ago, that it still resonates with the people of Europe, these, these blood baths. If you go to Europe today, uh, and I don't, I, don't, I don't care whether it's in France or the British Isles or, or, or Germany, uh, Italy, wherever, every town, even every little town, has its World War I memorial, mm -hmm. normally with the list of uh, uh, men from that town or that vicinity who died during the Great War. Mm -hmm. And the lists are usually pretty lengthy. Well, these, they are. These monuments are everywhere. You mentioned the, the, the horrors of uh, Verdun and the Somme. If you talk about uh, overall casualties, and the casualty rates, by the way, in World War I uh, uh, were greater than those of World War II. And that surprises people, I'm sure, uh, to learn that. Yeah. You talk about, for Germany, for example, 11 million men were mobilized. That's a total number of men called up in Germany to serve in the military, 11 million. There were 7 million casualties. Casualties dead, wounded, missing in action. To put it another way, 63% of the German army were casualties. You didn't even have a 50-50 chance of surviving this war. Uh, 
France, about eight and a half million men mobilized. France had a smaller population than Germany. Casualty rate of 73%. To put it another way, seven out of every 10 French soldiers, dead or wounded. The Russian army, Russia mobilized more than any other country, mobilized 15 million men, had a casualty rate of 60%, about 9 million. Uh, they, the generals ran through troops like you might run through a pe pieces of chewing gum during mm -hmm. a day. And they had no solution for the machine gun or the heavy artillery. Mm -hmm. Now you do hear about some exotic weapons like poison gas, mm -hmm. but poison gas was tricky business and had very little effect on the war. Um, the airplane came into use. Um, uh, it was used primarily for reconnaissance, although once they figured out uh, how they could synchronize a machine gun and a, and a propeller, mm -hmm. because you don't want to shoot off the propeller when you're firing a machine gun, mm -hmm. um, and put a few primitive bombs on them or throw them out of the cockpit, you could terrorize enemy could. lines. But, but the airplanes were used primarily for reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. But it was primarily the machine gun. Mm -hmm. and the, our uh, heavy On the artillery. topic of the propeller, and you're absolutely right about that, my great uncle was, went over with the American uh, um, American Air Force, Air Corps back then, and he was an armorer on a plane, and, and the, he was the one who was supposed to time the machine gun. And you want to make sure you got that right. So <laughs> before this mission, he, he got in the cockpit, taxied out to the end of the runway where there was a dirt bank to test fire the guns. He shot the propeller off. Oh. <laughs> and uh, he got a good cussing from the sergeant. But, uh, you know, you want, that, you want that to happen on the ground and not at 5,000 right. feet in the air. But, yes, you think about that, the technology uh, of, of yeah. war. And, and it pioneers. And, of course, the tank is, is, is pioneered in the first war. Not very effective. But you can see the potential in these weapons, the machine gun, uh, aircraft submarines all this stuff is pioneered in world war one and has a much more deadly effect it'll come to world fruition war absolutely uh, world does. War II. it does uh, when we're talking about casualty rates and death rates the united states which entered the war uh in april of 1917 and would be there through 1918 we really did not have a full complement of military troops there until probably the spring of 1918 it took a while to mm -hmm. mo uh, train and mobilize men and and ship them across the ocean. Our casualty rate, let's compare this to the French casualty rate of 73%, our, our casualty rate was 8%. Uh, uh, the French suffered about one and a half million military deaths in the war. We, sell, we uh, uh, incurred about 125,000, mm -hmm. which was shock enough uh, oh, in yeah. this country. Um, so our losses were not as great, but of course we were not involved as long in the war. Mm -hmm. But of course, the American, the, the Germans will finally pack this thing in, largely because the American potential, the economic potential, this oh, this long line of fresh meat coming this way in 1918. Uh, but you're absolutely right. By the end of the war, and it does, you, you can't just put a uniform on a man and say you're a soldier. It takes training, and uh, so we don't go over there. It was called until until quite late in the war. So. Finally, in 1918, the stalemate in this trench warfare is broken. The Allies launch this grand offensive. Germany is finished off. Meanwhile, some big events in Russia going on about mm, 1917. What's going on with Nicky and his fellows okay. and Rasputin and all that stuff? Um, Russia performed very poorly during the war. In fact, in 1914, two whole Russian armies, I think the first and second armies, um, were lost. They were gone in, in two major battles, great German victories. Part of the problem is that the Russians were, were unprepared for mo modern warfare. The wireless, the radio was being used. Uh, the Russians, uh, unfortunately, were not transmitting uh, orders in code. So all the Germans had to do was tune in on the Russian frequency, and the Russians wow. never did figure out what was going on. But Russia was never able to... to, to uh, 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 prepare to fight this war. She didn't have the uh, transportation uh, uh, resources, the industrial resources, and the like. In fact, uh, by 1917, uh, Russian soldiers, new recruits were being sent up to the front without weapons and told, if you, need it, if you want a weapon, get one off a fallen dead comrade. And the result was rebellion. There were food shortages uh, in Russian cities. 
the Russian Tsar thought he would go to the front and conduct the war, and he knew nothing about military activities. He left his wife and Rasputin <laughs> in charge of the domestic front, and they made a botch of it. Uh, by 1916 and 1917, the Russian people had turned against the war, they had turned against the monarchy at all, at all levels, from the aristocracy down to the peasant. And the result in 1917 is that there was an uprising in St. Petersburg, the capital of Russia, and uh, uh, Nicholas abdicated. He abdicated with a whimper. Mm -hmm. And a provisional government was established. They wanted to continue the war. There was another small group in, in Russia, the Communist Party, um, and uh, they had not come to, to power yet. Their, their leader, Lenin, was in Switzerland, and the Germans arranged for him to be transported across Germany, an get this, story. Yeah. across this, into, in, into Finland and then into Russia, uh, because he could perhaps disrupt the Russian war effort, yeah. then German troops could all be moved to the Western Th Front. That's an amazing story. It is. And you know, the, the, Lenin arrives in the Finland station there in Petrograd, now Leningrad, now yeah. back to St. Petersburg. And, and the locomotive, by the way, is, is in a glass case. That's right. I've seen it. It's like, wow. I mean, I collect HO trains, but <laughs> boy, nothing like this. This is th fantastic. Uh, yeah. So, the Bolsheviks grab power in the autumn and the, pull the Russia Bolsheviks out. grab grab the Bolsheviks seize power because the provisional government, which was basically a middle class government, tried to continue the war. And that was his fatal mistake. It's fatal mistake and, and Lenin and his group of the Communist Party known as the Bolsheviks uh, said that they would end the war. They would offer peace, bread, and land. Mm -hmm. Pre peace meaning end the war, bread meaning food, and land to the peasants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and they came to power in St. Petersburg. They then signed this horrendously bad treaty for Russia called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. And by this treaty, Russia lost probably 20% of its population, 30% mm -hmm. of its industry, but it ended the war. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what Russians wanted across the board. They wanted out of the war. They the, wanted out everybody of the war. So now the Germans have this massive force. They can move to the Western Front. Doesn't do them any good. They move it to the Western Front. They also believe that with submarine warfare, they could knock, American supplies were essentially keeping mm -hmm. Britain and France in the war. Mm -hmm. With submarine warfare, they'd be able to knock the British and French out of the war and they would win. They knew the United States would come into the war. The United States got into the war more quickly. Submarine warfare was blunted with the convoy system. And in 1918, it was not possible for the Germans to continue their resistance. Mm -hmm. um, one of the requirements that the United States government laid down is that the German monarchy would have to be brought to an end. And uh, the German army therefore announced the abdication of uh, the, the uh, German emperor. He did not do this voluntarily and he was hustled off into, into, into uh, the Netherlands. Meanwhile, in Austria-Hungary, this huge multi-ethnic empire, as the war went terribly, uh, and there were rebellions everywhere, and uh, by 1918, the, the constituent parts of the empire were declaring their independence, and uh, that, uh, that, in essence, brought an end to the monarchy there. Mm -hmm. We have less than 10 minutes to, to wrap this up, and then, of course, now we get into, I think, an absolutely essential part of this, and that is the ramifications of this war. Uh, President Wilson, very idealistic fellow, we're going to make the world safe for democracy. He puts forth his 14 points for peace, which I know are derided. But I, I used to tell my classes, if, and that's the biggest two-letter word in the English language, if all the nations of the world had agreed to this, there couldn't have been a war. But that's the thing. They're not going to do this. Talk about the 14 points. The 14 points, which were, were, the, were the first attempt to make World War I a contest for something larger than what brought these countries in. It was not democracy. France is allied with the most backward uh, autocracy in Europe, Russia. N none of that. But, but idealism w came into existence with the 14 points. The 14 points were an effort to do away with the root causes of World War I. 
and Wilson was right on the mark with the 14 points. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. He called for a League of Nations. We know that today as the United Nations. It would do away with all of these alliances. You wouldn't need alliances if all the countries could meet together. It would do away with secret treaties. Uh, there would be strict military controls, which would do away with military alliances. There would be what he called self-determination of nations. Each nationality would have its own country. Uh, that way there would not have been a Bosnia where uh, Franz Ferdinand would be assassinated. Mm -hmm. uh, the nations of the world would become democratic. Um, there would be peace without victory. The enemy nations would not be punished. Uh, Germany took some consolation in the 14 points. But then, of course, the French, uh, Clemenceau, the tiger, they're burning with revenge. And what was it Clemenceau said? God gave us the Ten Commandments. Wilson gave us 14 points. We, we shall, shall see. see. That, that is true. Everybody applauded the 14 points in the United States and in these other countries. But in the United States, we'd ra waged war against Germany with slogans like, kill the Hun, <laughs> hang the Kaiser, right. uh, do away with everything German. You don't create hatred and turn it off like a water faucet. Mm -hmm. And people said the 14 points are wonderful, but boy, we want to get those Germans. The same thing, as you can well imagine, took place in these European countries with these staggering losses. Well, especially France. And in France, which wanted revenge. It mm -hmm. wanted to... Uh, and they remembered the Franco-Prussian War. They remembered the Franco-Prussian oh, yeah. War. Uh, the British wanted to destroy the German Navy and do away with German economic mm. power. And that uh, was one of the points of freedom of the seas, and the British are not interested yeah, in that freedom, too much. Freedom of the seas was a, it was a hoary American, H-O-A-R-Y, a right. hoary American right. <laughs> uh, 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 doctrine that went back uh, uh, to the Washington, George Washington administration, right. which meant neutral ships should be able right. to to uh, travel freely during right. time of war. So the, result, so, so the result of all this is the Treaty of Versailles. The Treaty of Versailles. Which is not very Wilsonian in its look. The, the, Treaty of, the Treaty of Versailles was a treaty between the victorious nations and Germany. The, the uh, defeated nations, by the way, did not participate in the negotiations. They're handed the treaty. Mm -hmm. the, uh, and the Russians aren't invited. The Russians they, are not they, invited they wimped either. out. That's correct. Yeah. The League of Nations was established but the list of uh, uh, punishments handed out to Germany are staggering, mm -hmm. uh, including the war guilt clause in which Germany had to assume all responsibility for having caused the war, which was patently untrue. Her mil military was reduced to a shadow of itself. Mm -hmm. She was saddled with reparations, which were to be paid through 1971. Mm -hmm. This was not a peace without victory. Mm -hmm. Wilson had to agree to all of these terrible features of the treaty in order to get uh, his League of Nations uh, into the Which he the hoped treaty. would go back and take the sting out of right, this. Right, which he thought over time would, right. would uh, reduce the, right. the sting. The trouble right. is the United States never joined the League of Nations. Mm -hmm. The treaty in the League of Nations became a f political football. In fact, it had even before Wilson went to Paris for negotiations mm -hmm. because he failed to include the Republicans. And the Republicans wanted to say so in the peace. They wanted to win the 1920 elections. Mm -hmm. And uh, oddly enough, the Republican uh, isolationists and reservationists, as they were called, didn't zero in on the harsh treatment of Germany. They zeroed in on the League of Nations. The one mm -hmm. thing Woodrow Wilson would not compromise on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like a Greek tragedy, Woodrow Wilson returns to the United States, suffers a ma massive stroke, is only a shadow of his former self, unwilling to compromise. Mm -hmm. And in the end, the Treaty of Versailles is defeated in the United States because Woodrow Wilson ordered his fellow Democrats to vote against the treaty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so now, the, of course we could go on for the two hours and the legacy <laughs> of this war, but one of the things that strikes me about it is before the war, there's this boundless optimism in the Western world. Look at all of the gadgets we've invented, automobiles, airplanes, all kinds of things to make us live longer, healthier, happier in lives. We're brilliant people. We dominate the world. And then all of a sudden you say, if we're so smart or we're so wonderful, how did we do this? And so now you have this whole period of disaffections like 
that indeed is true. There had been a period of 150 years prior to World War I in which it was thought that we rational individuals would discover these scientific laws, we'd put them into effect, and the result would be progress, steady improvement of the human race. Mm -hmm. And then comes World War I. What did these scientific laws do? They led to the machine gun, mm -hmm. they led to artillery, they led to the senseless killing. And it seemed that progress was not a result of science. Mm -hmm. And it led to the feeling that, that the irrational had dominated. And you see, you see the shift in art. You oh, yeah. see it in literature. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and the shift takes place. You see it in the political world when you get the irrational coming to the fore as you do in, in Germany in the 1920s and, in, and elsewhere as well. Italy. Mm -hmm. And in Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, the war also brought an end to Europe, European domination of the world. Europe was the economic uh, a center, the banking center of the world. That, that ended. The mm -hmm. power shifted to the United States, yes. which refused to exercise that power in the 1920s. And of all the nations, the United States is the only one that comes out of this war in better shape than that it was That is correct. Before. comes out stronger than it did before. It does. And the same is true of World War II. The United States right. came out stronger right. after the right. war than it had right. been before. Why do you think that in popular culture that World War II is more well known than World War I? World War II, I think, is, is more well known known because of the, the evil of the countries we were fighting. Right. Uh, right. Uh, Nazi, Germany, and the concentration camps. Also, World War II was a war of movement, military yes. movement, uh, yes. whether it be in the Pacific Theater or with D-Day, for example, mm -hmm. in, in Normandy. Mm -hmm. uh, World War I was not a war of movement. It was a war of attrition, grinding, uh, uh, slow attrition. Mm -hmm. um, and you, and you don't get the, the dashing military commanders as heroes that you do in World War II. That's you don't true. get an Eisenhower or a Patton mm -hmm. or a George C. Marshall mm -hmm. like, like you did in World That's War true. I. That's true. And I was thinking about uh, the British, the satire. There was a British television program called The Black Adder. And the last part is about World War One, and it talks. There's a line in there where it says, "Yes, we're going to attack today because the general wants to move his drinks cabinet 150 yards close to Berlin." <laughs> and there's a lot of this satire about this. You're right, Haig, all these British generals and French generals. The, the, no, no one. There is. You're right. There's no Patton. There's no Eisenhower. There's, there's none of that or Montgomery in it. But again, it, it's as we look at this hundredth anniversary. This was such a pivotal event in world history. And again, in this country, maybe we were talking earlier, maybe in, in uh, 2017, we might see a pickup in it, but it was such a huge event. I don't know. Event. It's interesting to, to notice the way in which we commemorate Veterans Day. It's for people, for living veterans. Right. And by the way, for years, it was Armistice it was Day Armistice when we were State. kids, yeah, November yeah. the 11th. Still uh, is yeah. in Europe. On Arm yeah, uh, on Armistice Day, which was November 11th when I was in school. Oh, me too. At 11 o'clock in the morning. Right. The war ended at the 11th hour uh, oh, of the yeah. 11th Gives day. Gives me cold chills 11 to hear that. 11 a.m. Yeah. on November 11th. Yeah. And at, at 11 a.m. on November 11th in school, we all stood up mm -hmm. and we turned and faced east mm -hmm. towards Europe, towards the battle. Ground. And we stood there for, for a minute of silence. Right. And even, even on the city streets, traffic would slow exactly and business right. activities would come to yes, a stop yes. for a minute. But the we're other problem have to with... Go ahead. Very quickly, we're going to bring this to The other to problem stop. with World War I is there are no living veterans. Right. They're all gone. And we're out of time. Dave, thank you for coming. Let's talk about something else later on at the end of the show. <laughs> I'm Barry Craig. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.